Watch your step, the fairy captain told me, opening the gate. It's a long way down and the water's cold. The sea had been choppy on the way across from the mainland. The sky gray and foreboding of rain. Captain Flanders and I had talked the whole time inside the warmth of his cabin, as I attempted to soothe my nerves with conversation, and to distract myself from what was right outside the windows all around us. Don't look outside. Don't look at the water. Pretend you're at home in the city on dry land. It had partially worked. I, I hadn't thrown up, and well, that was an improvement from my last time at sea. My legs were wobbly as I stepped across the gap, trying not to look down. Despite the pier being totally still, I felt my body swaying up and down with the phantom sway of the ocean waves we'd experienced during our two-hour journey on the small boat. I was safely on the island now. That pit in the bottom of my stomach should have been going away. But it wasn't. Why did I still feel so uneasy? The words of the ferry captain came to mind again, from our conversation during the boat ride. You be careful on Crimson, you hear me? He'd said. You seem like a nice enough fellow. Though I don't pay much mind to what happens on the island, I do hear things. An old timer like me, we hear things. We stow them away for safekeeping. And one thing I heard is that this island ain't so kind to outsiders. If you start to feel nervous for any reason, you pack up, you head for dry land, okay? Seagulls laughed and swooped through the air nearby on a rock-strewn beach littered with bottles and old newspapers. A thunderhead in the distance crackled to life with electricity, flashing white momentarily and startling me from my recollections. I looked back to see the ferry captain standing on the other side of the bridge. An anxious look writ large across his face. Thanks again, I said to the man, careful as I made my way across the slippery wooden boards, my feet wanting to skid and slide with each step forward, and I braced myself with one hand, grabbing onto the thick rope which served as a railing. It looked as if I was the only one visiting the island, I realized, as the captain closed the gate behind me and went back to his cabin. The vessel was small, and I hadn't seen anyone else aboard. Still, I was surprised to confirm that I was the only passenger. Over here, detective. A man was calling me from the gravel parking lot nearby, and I walked over towards him. He was slender, with glasses and a mustache, carrying a coffee cup in one hand and a donut in the other. The policeman was wearing a worn, salt-stained blue rain slicker, more befitting a fisherman than a man of the law. Rain began to patter down on us from above as he met me halfway, popping the donut into his mouth and taking my bag with his free, white powder-covered hand. Welcome to Crimson Island, he said, his mouth chewing the donut and making it disappear in one large swallow. We spoke on the phone. I'm Chief Varnson, but you can just call me Bill. Nice to meet you, Bill. I wasn't expecting you to meet me out here, but I appreciate it. Can you point me in the direction of a motel or a bed and breakfast? I don't need much, just somewhere to lay my head overnight. Our voices were drowned out by the increasing noise of the rainstorm, and I had to speak loudly to be heard. Thunder boomed a ways off in the distance, drawing nearer. Nothing like that around here, he said, opening the passenger door of his car to let me in. But you can stay with me if you like. My wife passed away a couple years back, and I wouldn't mind the company. How long did you plan on being here? As long as I have to. I'll take you up on the bed offer. I'll pay you for the hospitality. I'm not one to freeload. Besides, my client is paying for my room and board. We both got in and he started the engine. Rain dripped off of us and he turned on the heat and the wiper blades as it began to fall even harder. A staccato beat like pounding drums on the roof of the car as we drove toward town. Who is your client, anyway? I wasn't clear on that when we spoke on the phone. That I'm not at liberty to discuss, unfortunately, but I, I do appreciate your help, Chief Varnson. Bill. Right. Thanks again, Bill. As he turned down a gravel road, I saw something in the trees, retreating suddenly as we approached. A large, hulking shape like a bear, but not quite. Lots of wildlife on the island? I asked, suddenly nervous. I, I think I just saw something. 
Could have been a bear. I'm, I'm not sure. No bears around here. Closest thing we got is deer. Brought over from the mainland at some point by hunters. So they had something to do. But the damn things are out of control nowadays. They probably outnumber the people ten to one. Not that that's saying much. We drove past a lot of abandoned houses on the outskirts of town. Many of them half collapsed with their roofs caving in. But as we got further along, I saw houses with cars outside and their lights on, so I suppose it wasn't a complete ghost town. Why did so many people pack up and move away? I asked. Uh, there's not many jobs left on Crimson since the cannery closed. Fishing ain't what it used to be. Every year I look around and there's a few less familiar faces. No sense sticking around if there's no jobs. That's the way I figure it. He drove through downtown and we finished the journey in an awkward silence. This is it, Bill said as we arrived outside an old two-story building with a porch out front. A battered sign with faded blue letters swayed in the wind on rusty chains from the eaves, and I barely made out the words, Police Station. He showed me the ramshackle bullpen with its single small jail cell, leading me up a set of creaking wooden stairs at the rear of the main level. There was a small guest room on the second floor with an uncomfortable bed and dusty sheets where I could lay my head for the night. The only amenity was a hard wooden chair which I sat on for a while, looking out the window at the falling droplets glowing in the street lamp's light. The town was quiet aside from the sound of pounding rain and rumbling thunder in the distance. I didn't see anyone walking the streets until the following morning. By then, the sun was out shining, and my mood had grown considerably warmer with the weather. Still, I'd be happy to get this case over with and get home, I thought to myself. This little town was rubbing me the wrong way. Its people were polite, but somehow cold at the same time. A cheerful voice called out, Good morning, to me, and I looked up to see someone approaching me on the street. I was standing out on the veranda, enjoying the fresh air after a long night of allergies and unwashed bed linen. "'You must be the detective,' a woman in a flowery yellow dress said, smiling blandly and pushing her baby down the road in a stroller. "'I'm Cindy Fox, and this is little Susie. We were just out for a stroll, and I thought we'd pop by and say hello.' I was slightly stunned by the interaction. Everything about it just felt odd. The woman's smile was forced and tight, telling me she wasn't as happy as her voice indicated. Even her baby didn't look right. Her eyes were too intelligent and seemed to study me, judging me like an outsider, which I supposed I was. Uh, nice to meet you, I managed to say, my throat dry and tight. Susie and Cindy, very pretty names. Can I ask, how did you know I was a detective? And I should mention, I'm a private detective now. I'm not with the police force anymore. Oh, we know. It's a small community here on the island, Detective. Word gets around very quickly. Nothing's kept secret for long. She walked off without another word, leaving me with that growing sense of unease again. What was it about this place? Was there something in the drinking water making everyone act so strange? No wonder my client had hired me to look into the suspicious circumstances surrounding the disappearance of... Getting settled all right? A voice asked from behind me, interrupting my thoughts. It was Bill, the police chief. He walked right past me out onto the gravel road, yawning and stretching as if the main street were his living room. Yeah, so far so good, I said. Hey, can you point me towards the general store? I need to get something to eat. They'll be closed today. It's a Monday. On the island, just about everything is closed on Sundays and Mondays. Damn. I didn't bring much with me. Is there a, a place nearby I could get somebody to tide me over till tomorrow? Head up to the marina, Bill said, pointing down the street. It's right near where I picked you up last night. Closest thing to a corner store we got on the island. If you keep going past the docks, you'll see it. Uh, did you want a lift? Nah, I'm good. I could use the exercise. Thanks for the offer, though. Alright, suit yourself. Enjoy your walk, detective. I started heading off, and he called after me, telling me to wait. You know, if you told me what you were investigating, it would make it a lot easier for me to help you. I'm just saying, that's all. I know you got your deal with your client, but between two men of the law, 
I think it should be all right to bend the rules a little bit, don't you? He had been persistent on the phone as well. The chief liked to know what was happening in his own backyard, and I couldn't blame him for that. I'll give it some thought, I said, trying to be diplomatic. You might have a point. Fair enough, he allowed, and I kept going on my way, my stomach rumbling with emptiness. I got about twenty paces down the road before I saw another face. A man was trimming his bushes near the street, using a giant, oversized pair of hedge clippers. His smile was similarly wide and welcoming, just like the chief. Just like the woman with the baby stroller and the baby. But I couldn't help picturing him taking those hedge clippers and sneaking up behind somebody with them, closing them around their neck and sending their head flying off like the top of a dandelion. "'Good morning, detective. Fine day for a walk.' The man continued snipping the greenery with his enormous shears as I approached, but his eyes were fixed on me. By the time I got near to him, he was only trimming the air, missing the plant entirely. Hello, I said, my anxiousness increasing again. Heh, it seems as if everyone in town knows about me. I tried to say this in as friendly of a tone as I could, but it was becoming difficult to maintain my composure. Oh, well, it's a small place, Crimson Island. Word gets around quickly. I'm David O'Brien, the town gardener. I keep all the hedges trimmed round here. Mow the grass, plant the flowers, all that dirty business. Ha <laughs> ha! I tend to the cemetery as well, don't you know? His voice was heavily accented, and it was difficult to understand the man. He seemed to be trying to hold in laughter, as if some joke were very funny, but I wasn't privy to it. After his introduction, he turned on his heel and wandered off to another part of the property, giggling, his hedge clippers dragging in the grass behind him, digging up the immaculately maintained sod with reckless abandon. The interaction left me feeling disturbed, even more than I already was, and that was saying a lot. I was beginning to consider shortening my stay on Crimson Island perhaps leaving tonight to come back with official reinforcements would be the safest bet. Any longer than that, and I might find out where my client's sister had ended up much more intimately than I would like. Continuing on my walk, I passed several more residents. They were mowing the grass, sitting on their porches, sipping coffee, and walking down the street with dogs on leashes. And yet, each time the same thing happened. "'Good morning, detective,' cheered a man, fetching his mail. That same vacant look in his eyes and the same inhibited grin that was growing so familiar. He produced a knife from his pocket and I had jumped backwards, but then I saw he was just using it to open his mail. He did so smiling, his eyes never leaving mine. I hurried away, moving briskly down the street again, my head turning on a swivel. Good morning, detective, laughed an elderly man on his porch, whittling something that resembled a pagan idol while resting on a rocking chair in the shade. Fine day for a walk. Good morning, detective, a woman walking her poodle said, startling me as she appeared from nowhere on the other side of me. I jumped back and spiked my spine against the top of a picket fence, crying out in pain. She tilted her head and went past, grinning and giggling as if my injury were the funniest thing in the world. Even her dog was smiling at me. Was I losing my mind? I picked up my pace, trying not to look alarmed. It felt as if I was surrounded by bloodthirsty animals rather than well-wishing pedestrians. There was a forested area on either side of the road up ahead, and I rushed towards it. By then, I couldn't help myself. I stopped, and I turned around, looking back at the town square. Everyone on the street was stock still and glaring at me when I turned around. The smiles gone from their faces, replaced by blank stares. Shuddering, I looked away instinctively. It felt like I was in an episode of the Twilight Zone. I began to walk again, hurrying through the forested area towards the marina up ahead. It wasn't far, and yet I was feeling more terrified than I had ever been in my life. Suddenly, I remembered the bear that I had seen in the woods the day before. Bill said it couldn't have been, but it sure looked big, whatever it was. Darting my gaze to either side... I looked into the shadows of the trees, trying to see if anything was pursuing me. To my dismay, there was. A dark form was moving from tree to tree, 
blending in with the shadows and just barely visible. It was moving in the same direction I was, but on a diagonal, its trajectory headed to cut me off up ahead. I hurried even faster, running through the trees as fast as my legs would take me. The thing moved quickly despite its size, but not as fast as me. After a while, I managed to gain a lead on it by sprinting, and I was soon out of the forested area completely. I went over to the building with a large sign out front reading, Marina, Gas and Snacks. The bell above the door tinkled as I entered, huffing and puffing, feeling out of breath from my short run, so terrified I'd completely forgotten to breathe for a few moments. Can I help you? A man wearing a green trucker hat asked from behind the counter. I took him in, trying to decide if he was alright. He was the first person who didn't greet me with a smile, knowing exactly who I was before I even opened my mouth. For some reason I took that as a good sign. Maybe he wasn't one of them, whoever they were. Still, I didn't dare risk telling him what I'd just seen. I tried to calm myself and just act as if everything was normal. I tried to fool myself a little bit even, telling myself that maybe it actually was. Maybe I'd just been seeing things out there. Just looking for something to eat, I said, scanning the half-bare shelves. Not much to go around today. We get new stock on Tuesday, he replied, pointing to some off-brand chips and soda. There was also a rack with expired bags of pretzels and an assortment of gum. Nothing with any protein or sustenance to it. I would have settled for beef jerky, but they didn't even have that. It would be a long day at this rate, I thought, my stomach gurgling loudly again. I put a few items on the counter and gave the man his money, not feeling the least bit satisfied with my purchases of sodium and empty calories. There was a sign over the man's shoulder which said they sold tickets for the ferry. What time does the boat leave today? I asked, thinking I would make a break for it while it was still possible to do so. It doesn't. No ferry on Mondays. Oh. My heart began to hammer faster. Another 24 hours on Crimson Island. That didn't sit well with me at all. I had planned to stay for a few weeks, but now I just wanted out. Uh, can I buy a ticket for tomorrow? Sure you can. That'll be 15 bucks. He said, printing off a receipt. He handed it to me and put my items in a bag. I turned around and started walking out of the little building when he called after me. Sorry to hear you're leaving so soon, detective. We do hope you'll visit us again. My blood ran cold as I opened the door and walked out, not looking back. I didn't even have to see him to know that he was smiling as I left. I could hear it in his voice. I pulled out my cell phone and saw an out-of-service message displayed across the top, just like it had said the night before. Knowing I had to get a message back to one of my colleagues about this place before it was too late, I started hurrying back towards the police station. The shadow thing in the forest pursued me again on my walk back into town, this time choosing to remain at a distance. I only hoped it would stay that way. Make yourself look big. Speak in a low, loud voice. And never, ever run. I remembered hearing those things about grizzly bears. Maybe they would translate to this situation as well. Don't let them know you're scared. Pretend you're more powerful than you are. I had to get a message back home and get some backup out here pronto. The idea was clear in my mind as I speed walked out of the forest down the street towards the police station, trying not to make eye contact with the smiling faces who walked past, greeting me one after another. By the time I got back to the police station, I was out of breath and exhausted, shaking as I closed the door behind me. Bill was nowhere to be seen. I went straight over to the phone on his desk and picked it up to find the line was dead. All the connections looked fine, so I went upstairs to my little bedroom, thinking maybe I could get some cell signal up there. I needed to get a call out to the mainland somehow. I needed help. But of course, the phone didn't work. My stomach rumbled and gurgled again, and I looked at the bag of pretzels I had purchased, thinking it wouldn't be wise to eat them. It would be better to starve than to risk eating anything from this place. Still, the longer I sat there staring at the bag, the more I began to think I was being foolish. It was a sealed bag of pretzels. There was no way anybody tampered with it. I opened the bag and began to munch on the salty snacks. Of course, I got thirsty and opened the soda I had purchased as well, hearing the hiss of carbonation and the click of the seal, and taking that as a good sign for my safety. 
Although I didn't recognize either brand name of the pretzels or the soda, they tasted pretty good. Only faintly strange. After eating and drinking for a while, I sat looking out the bedroom window, sitting up in the chair and trying to decide my next move. My eyelids began growing heavy as I saw people converging outside the police station, wearing brown hooded robes and carrying torches, pitchforks, and pikes. I tried to stand up, but I couldn't. My legs were numb and my arms weighed a thousand pounds suddenly. They hung limply at my sides. Distantly, I heard someone open the door to the bedroom as I began to fade in and out of consciousness. Looking up at the people in the doorway, I saw Bill was standing there staring at me, and I realized that I was laying on the floor now. Uh, the pretzels, I mumbled. Poison. He began putting zip ties around my wrists and cinching them together tightly. Sorry, detective, he said, looking down at me. It's so hard to get sacrifices for Belisama these days. No tourists come to Crimson Island anymore. We had to start getting creative to appease her. Belisama? The word was strange and unfamiliar. I tried to think what it could mean, but my mind felt like it was full of quicksand. Come on, let's go to the ceremony. It's just about to begin, but can't start without you. You're the guest of honor, detective. I passed out after hearing those words, and dreamt of drowning in brackish waters, screaming and taking in salt water instead of air as the undertow dragged me deeper. When I woke up, I was hanging from a rope, tied upside down to a pole. The water was beneath my face, and it was only a few inches away. The residents of the town were on the beach, wearing robes and chanting as the waves lapped at their bare feet. Chief Varnson was at the center of them all, looking out at me and holding an open book in his hands. The ancient tome looked weather-worn and salt-stained from decades or perhaps centuries of use. Beside him stood a gigantic man, at least eight feet tall, wearing a hat made from a bear's head. The thing which had been pursuing me in the forest had been a man, after all. An enormous man, nearly the size of a grizzly. He would have subdued me and brought me here but that hadn't been necessary. I'd done their work for them by eating the tainted food laced with sedatives. You, detective, will serve as a sacrifice to Belisama, goddess of the seas, the one who blesses all fishermen with good yields. As the tide comes in, it will plunge your head beneath the cleansing salt water, and the goddess herself will come to visit you as you take your last breaths. Be thankful, detective. You should be honored to see her visage. I screamed as the waves began to tickle my forehead. Then the sea started to submerge my face completely with occasional white caps as the tide came in and the water rose higher and higher, engulfing my face. Gulping in a belly full of water, I felt terrified and sick. The liquid went up my nose and I felt panic rising inside of me as I struggled to reach the surface but couldn't. I was completely submerged, thrashing while I dangled upside down in the surging waves. The ocean water was cold but clear, revealing the reef below with schools of fish and kelp that danced in front of me and tickled my face. As I started losing consciousness, I saw something else as well. A beautiful woman was swimming towards me. I thought for a moment, perhaps, that she was coming to save me. But then she opened her yawning mouth to reveal her teeth, long and sharp enough to rip the flesh from my bones, curved and serrated like a piranha. A long tail flowed out behind her, the coloring of it black and white like a killer whale. Belisama. Her skin looked blue in the water, her serrated tooth smile growing wider as she swam closer to me. I squirmed and bucked against the ropes holding me, but it was no use. I cringed as she got close enough to scrape her fingernails against my cheek. 
She opened her mouth wider than I would have thought possible, and I closed my eyes, waiting for it to close around my neck. But then suddenly I felt myself being lifted upwards by the rope around my ankles. My head emerged from the water to see a blessed sight. Captain Flanders, the ferry captain who brought me over to the island, was pulling me up onto the deck of a small fishing boat. Meanwhile, on the shoreline, the residents of Crimson Island were screaming and throwing things in our direction. Several of them were even wading out into the water in their cultish robes, looking ready to climb aboard the vessel and attack us. Those unfortunate souls ended up filling in as sacrifices to Belisama, as she didn't differentiate between her worshippers and the tourists. All she saw was meat, and the goddess was hungry. The water turned red with their blood, and I saw limbs flying through the air, and their terrified faces screaming and gurgling in the salt water. But then the boat began to move, and those horrible sights and sounds faded into the distance. Pretty soon all I could hear was the roar of the engine, and I closed my eyes, trying to forget the nightmare of Crimson Island. I wish I had better news for my client, but I'm going to have to pass this case on to higher authorities. This mystery is far beyond my pay grade. But either way, I'm pretty sure I know what happened to her sister. Belly Sama is always hungry. And she has a taste for tourists now. The story was written by me, and a variation of it previously appeared on the Dr. No Sleep podcast. If you want to hear more stories written by me and other great authors... Check out his podcast and YouTube channel where he also shares high quality horror animations and audio works. Links can be found in the description. Today's video was supported by patrons like Mark from Earth, Crimson Muse, Joy Burton, Diane Showers, Mark Zuwall, Cheryl James, Pick Your Sticker, Teddy Dog, Clue 404, Mamakado, Dante Kincaid, Zarin Ray, Angela Donovan, Blair Ann 50, Devin Kyle, Timothy Baird, Ajeti, Burt Turner, Bajani Espinal, Michael Pierce, Big Joe, Carrie Harkonnen, and LaDonna Spivey. If you'd like to help support the channel, please consider joining my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Jordan Group Horror. As a patron, you'll get access to bonus videos and content. You'll be credited at the end of every video going forward. And if you decide to stay for three months, I'll name a character after you which will be featured in the next Hollow's End story. Characters have already started appearing in stories, so check that out if you're interested. Links to join are in the description. Thanks everyone for listening. Please like, subscribe, and comment to help the channel continue to grow. And see you again next time at 4pm Eastern Standard Time. Have a great night.